Well, you okay? <laughs> Thank you all for coming for the, to the uh, LBL and Earth Sciences Division Distinguished Seminar Series. And Jeff is going to introduce our speaker. So this is Jeff Chambers. Hello. I was tasked five minutes ago with introducing Nate. So, um, so Nate, um, he, got his, uh, he studies the interdependency of um, plant and ecosystem, water and carbon cycles, and the response to climate disturbance. He's done some really interesting work on um, how plants respond to um, um, water stress and drought and carbon starvation hypotheses and um, a lot of really interesting um, mechanisms that are important under a changing climate. He got his PhD at Morgan State in uh, tree physiology. He's, um, he's currently a staff scientist at, um, at Los Alamos National Lab since 2004. Um, he had the uh, director's postdoctoral fellowship at Lanel in 2003, um, the DOE's Distinguished Mentor Award for uh, advising undergraduates, the DOE's Early Career Award in 2010, and he testified before Congress um, on Dewey's climate change research in 2009. He's uh, published 65 plus papers since 2000, which is, um, that's quite a few per year. And uh, I'd like you to join me in welcoming uh, Nate, who will talk to us about um, uncertainties and challenges in understanding drought, vegetation, mortality, and climate consequences. Thanks for the very nice introduction. Can you guys hear me? Do you want me to keep this on? All right. Thanks also to Margaret for hosting my visit and to LBL for letting me come and hang out in Berkeley. You know, Berkeley's famous worldwide for the science that goes on here, particularly in the fields of research that I do. And uh, so it's quite an honor to be here. So yeah, this is the subject of my talk today. I'm going to focus on understanding how drought impacts vegetation, particularly the tree death, plant death, and talk a little bit about the climatic consequences or feedbacks that can arise from that. The outline for my talk is basically the first half will be on the societal problem. Why do we care about plant death? And the science problem, which is that we currently do not model plant death in a mechanistic manner. We haven't tested the models. So we don't know how accurate or reliable they are in terms of killing vegetation. And then the second half of the talk will be on a path forward. And this will, oh, nice. Uh, largely, I'll focus on stuff from my lab group on what we're trying to do to make the better dynamic global vegetation models. I'm an experimentalist by training, so I'm not going to talk a lot about model development, but more about the information we need to provide with our collaborators who can do the modeling. So, step number one, this is a figure from the Copenhagen diagnosis, diagnosis in 2009 where they highlighted major tipping elements of the globe that could be big issues in the future. And of course, they highlighted some mortality as uh, important potential, di uh, potential feedbacks. And in 2007, in their IPCC report, they highlighted that heat waves and droughts are very likely to become more prominent in the 21st century. This is a figure that I actually was introduced to last Friday. It came from Hansen at all, PNAS. Um, but this was shown in a testimony we did to the Senate on Friday, and which was actually a much more rewarding testimony than the one in 2009, because the one in 2009 was sort of um, not that productive in terms of making an impact. And we'll see if Friday's does, but at least we had a much more excited audience of uh, po politicians that really actually wanted to hear what we had to say. So it was pretty cool. This figure uh, shows the percentage area of land mass, in this case global, that has a declining amount of cold area, meaning how much of, this, of the Earth's surface is be is not labeled as cold anymore by, by James Hansen's analysis. This is the general trend over time for the amount of land at mass that's considered cold. And this is the, the elevation in temperature in areas that are hot, or the surface area of land mass that's getting warmer. And these are extreme, more extreme values, the lower two. And this is the same set of figures, but just for the northern hemisphere. 
So the point was that the data shows that the Earth is warming up. We have a paper just coming out now where we used remotely sensed information from MODIS to document this, which I like better because it's, uh, the vegetation is telling us what it's experiencing rather than an air temperature measurement. It may be a little more meaningful physiologically. And again, you can see that this isn't the best figure to show it, but there is an increasing trend of more surface area that's labeled red over the years here. And uh, I like that it shows the 2011 event where I live, which was a massive record drought in every way you could measure it, including fires, um, including humidity, temperatures. But it also is powerful because you can see lots of areas where the Earth's not being monitored that much also have lots of information, like the Amazon. So I'm pretty excited about using remote sensing in this manner. But just to show that other people have found these observations too, this is a paper, one of multiple, that have shown that there's a, been a decline in soil moisture globally and a decline in evapotranspiration. Those are the red areas. Uh, so, which, and I like this because these are more meaningful parameters to the vegetation than just air temperature or precipitation per se, right? Notice because some of us are interested in the tropics currently, uh, that there's very little data pantropical. White means no data. It doesn't mean neutral, right? So there's a big research need in this area. So this slide is, I'm always asked this question, and so I'm just going to put it up now to get it out of the way. It, people always ask, what, how do you define death? And I always am surprised by that question because it seems like an obvious thing to me. You know, like if a person's heart stops beating and, and it doesn't come back on for a week, they're gone, right? You know, and so in my, in, so, but we've tried to formalize this uh, in a paper I published in 2011. So we're calling it entropy, which, in other words, the loss of energy gradients between an organism and the environment that's surrounding it, right? Like such as across membranes. Uh, another way to define it more ecologically is an inability to reproduce, right? This, this guy is gone from the gene pool is, is one way to look at it. Now, there are two different types of mortality being talked being spoken about at the global scale right now. One is background mortality. And this is sort of the one in a hundred trees in the forest. If you go for a hike, you don't even really notice these trees, unless you're one of us who really is into this. Um, most people wouldn't notice it. But background, a, a change in background mortality could be, you know, a forest stand goes from losing one tree out of a hundred every 10 years to losing, let's say, two trees out of a hundred. It's a small, insidious type of mortality. Die-off is slang that I don't like, but it's really popular. Uh, for our regional scale mortality such as this, the, my office is right up on that mesa up there, and this is all dead uh, pinion trees. A little bit of green you see is juniper trees, or shrubs, which survived this mortality event in 2002. And dieback is the loss of branches or leaves without loss of the individual. Since we're in California, I wanted to highlight this slide because it's got big red bullseyes all over the state. Um, this is an, one of the earlier papers that showed that the background mortality rates are increasing, right? So, and so the red dots indicate an increase in mortality in some long-term forest inventory plot. A blue dot means a decrease in mortality. And the size of the red dot indicates the amount of mortality. And you can see it's quite ubiquitous, this pattern of death. And no matter how they analyze the data, they get an increasing mortality rate as, as time progresses. Right? This is very, very simple data, but it's very valuable because not very many people measure forest biomass and stocks on a routine basis for decades. Uh, here's an example of a regional die-off type mortality where you can see, I showed you this figure moments ago. This is my backyard, uh, northern New Mexico here. And this is remotely sensed Landsat-based assessment of all the mortality that's occurred from fire or from bark beetles, both of which are strongly associated with drought in, in, in northern New Mexico. And I live right there. And uh, you can see we kind of live in an epicenter of, of tree death. When I moved there in 2003, I saw these dead trees all over the landscape. I'm like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? I'm a tree physiologist. I have nothing to study. You know, and uh, after a year or two of moaning about that, I kind of just, I just stumbled onto somebody's PhD thesis that was never published in the 80s and it had a bunch of water potential data. And I suddenly realized, oh, 
there's something we could do here to figure out what's going on. And it's kind of changed my career. So anyway, in summary of the evidence that this is an issue, uh, there's quite a bit of data appearing now. We know that no biome is immune, boreal, tropical, high elevation, low elevation, wet, dry. There's evidence of trees dying, vegetation, shrubs dying as well in, in all biomes globally, right? At least all biomes that have vascular plants. And then here's the example I showed you from uh, a slide or two ago from California and the northwest and the interior. This is one from Canada's boreal forest that just came out. So these are both background mortality events. They're not huge die-offs, you know, die so to speak. But there is an increase in mortality within the forest. And this is the Amazonian example. Uh, the, the British guys don't make nice, pretty figures the way these guys did. But the, the red arrows pointing down mean that there was a lot of loss of biomass due to mortality in the Amazon after a 2005 drought. Um, I'm not only, I am focusing today on drought, but I'm not going to suggest that there aren't other parameters going on, such as wind throw in the Amazon or, or fires or other things. So why do we care? Well, we care because at least DOE cares, and I think the world cares, beyond just for economics or forestry or aesthetics or tourism or water quality. The reason I'm going to focus on today is that it can feed back on climate. If we lose a bunch of forest, that forest is no longer taking up carbon, but it is releasing carbon from all that dead biomass that's decomposing. So that becomes a positive climate forcing, right? Not to mention the changes in the energy fluxes and the water fluxes. So here's an example from, from our, our backyard. Again, I showed you this figure. Los Alamos is right there. And uh, this is the amount of biomass change which if you divide in half is carbon, uh, for the f land surface area that had mortality events and the areas that didn't have mortality events. A lot of this is actually mortality as well. It's just that Landsat only has 30 meter resolution. So that kind of background mortality is buried into these, image into these pixels. The point here, though, is that we have a more and more biomass being lost. And we don't know what's going to happen in the future, but we know in 2012 we're seeing dead trees all over the landscape where we live because it's been an extremely hot year. Um, so it looks like this trajectory may continue. Senator Bingaman, in my testimony Friday, really cared about this number because if we're ever going to have carbon trading, um, this, this really is a big number of carbon being lost from the system. This is a high-profile paper that came out in 2008 showing the same thing. Uh, in this case, they, it was largely model-derived, but these, this is direct observations of mortality. So if you thought we had a lot of mortality down here in New Mexico, take a look at British Columbia. You know, it's an amazing event. And it's, it was equivalent to, I think, five or six years of CO2 emissions from Canada's transportation sector. And, this, and then, you know, I think a year after this, they had a new prime minister or president, I don't know what it's called in Canada, and... Uh, who took this to heart and didn't want to sign any, any protocols for carbon trading. So these results make a big difference um, in terms of policy. Also, I'll point out, again, since we're in California, that uh, Arnold did a good job of stopping the beetles right there in the Oregon-California <laughs> border. I, I, you know, presumably, this is, has something to do with the way the detection surveys are done. But maybe California is going to survive. OK, so why does this matter scientifically? Well, models are important, as I highlighted a slide or two ago, or a slide ago, about the carbon effects. This is a um, paper that's not yet submitted. It shows broadleaf evergreen trees and needleleaf evergreen trees, predictions for the next 90 years from eight different models that are in IPCC AR5. Right? And the color indicates the agreement between the models that you'll have a 50% fractional decrease in these plant functional types. In other words, this isn't mortality explicitly. It's a change, but it's an index of mortality. So you can see most of the models agree that there shouldn't be much death, at least not up to the 50% level, in the tropics for broadleaf evergreen trees. This is a change from 10 years ago when we thought the Amazon was going to have a massive die-off. It doesn't mean it's right, but it's a positive result in that sense. However, uh, needleleaf evergreen trees look somewhat doomed, according to these eight models. 
well, how right are these simulations? If we're going to base a lot of policy on these simulations, we have to have some idea how, how good they are. So um, this is a table I don't expect you to read, but it's a, a summary that Rosie Fisher and I put together of the mechanisms that are embedded in the variety of popular DGVMs uh, used around the world. And the main point that Rosie always makes, um, I'm blaming it on her because it's a little harsh, is that the models are simplistic. Right? They're very underdeveloped relative to some other components of, of these global models. Um, the, you know, and there is, they are semi-mechanistic. You know, some of these components are, are reasonable. But it's, you know, this is, and this is the one that we've added, that Rosie and I have added to uh, CLM and ED, but there's still a long way to go. One critical point is that these aren't tested. You know, there hasn't been, I mean, there's been model inner comparisons of DGVMs, but there hasn't been comparisons with data, right? In part, that's because we don't have the data. So I always want to also mention that this isn't modelers' fault. It's you know, people like me need to tell them what are the relevant mechanisms that should be used. And we need to test these mechanisms. And once we do that, then I'm sure, I hope, people will use them. So here's an example of why this matters. Uh, this was a model in a comparison that um, Pierre Friedlinstein published with co-authors in 2006. And what it shows is that if you run a DGVM turned on, so the vegetation changes, and then you run that same DGVM, same climate forcing, with static vegetation, and you compare those two numbers, okay? In all cases, for each model, you get a growth in atmospheric CO2 when the DGVM is turned on. This isn't just mortality. It's a variety of processes, but mortality is one of them. This is due to a decline in land uptake of carbon, right? So this is one of the main reasons why we have to look at DGVMs is that, is, is two reasons, actually. One is that they all say that we're going to have a positive feedback on climate by raising atmospheric CO2. However, they also have a huge amount of scatter. And when this group of authors redid this analysis in 2008 in a paper led by Stephen Sitch, the numbers actually got much bigger than this. They didn't get smaller. Right? And that's where this number comes from. So hard to uh, put a lot of faith in these, in these models right now. So here's an example from my group. Uh, the, we, did, we used a CLM 3.5, fully coupled with CESM to look at what will happen in this part of the world, Western North America. And what this figure shows is the percentage cover change from 2000 to 2100 in needle leaf evergreen trees. Now, it shows a lot of decline in needle leaf evergreen trees in the northern portion of Western USA. It doesn't mean there isn't death down here. It's just that per grid cell, there isn't that much mortality down here. There isn't that many trees down here, right? And so you can see in this figure the change in PFT coverage for needle leaf evergreen trees, and this is the carbon consequence uh, of that change. And this is equal to six years of USA's current fossil fuel emissions. All right, so this is a, a fairly large number. Um, so we need to address this, it seems like. Another example, since some of us are interested in the tropics these days, is a group published a paper in 2011 suggesting that three different models would suggest a decline in carbon storage on the landscape. Red means less biomass in, in the tropics of the Amazon. However, when in the same paper, they ran those three models against two drought manipulations that had been done in the Amazon. This is a picture of one of them. And the models are the flat lines for these two different places. And then the circles are the observations of death. Right? So they don't capture the acute droughts. <coughs> now, these are artificial experiments, right? This isn't the real world. You know, there's other parameters. Maybe the models are right. And this just that this is a very artificial experiment. On the other hand, you have to put some faith in this experiment. It is somewhat the real world. And these models are showing almost no dynamics. So that could infer that these simulations are conservative. The point is we don't know, I, I don't think, how to model tree death yet. OK, so let's change gears. And this is a live tree. And I put it in because I, people accuse me of being really depressing. And so 
But the reality is, I think this science is really exciting. You know, even I mean, it's a sad subject, but it's very cool science because what we end up doing is studying from every t technique and every approach we have to address the question. So we don't just do remote sensing or just do isotopes and just do physiology. We have to take all these things into account to solve this huge problem. So let's go on and address some of the approaches that, that we use to try to resolve this. So I think it's important to pay deference to, to the, the people that did this before us. And Mannion was the first guy to really try to put into a, it's qualitative but semi-quantitative framework about what kills plants, right? And in his case, he called things predisposing factors, an example of which would be living in a place with bad soils, right? And then inciting factors, such as an insect attack or drought, et cetera, that, mag that sort of exacerbate the problem of having low soil moisture holding capacity in this example. And then contributing factors, such as basically the last straw, right? The attack of some agent or some activity that just pushes this plant over the edge. And then Dick Waring added a much more quantitative way of thinking about this in the future. The chicken and the egg is just to highlight that one of the punchlines of, of the science right now for me is we still don't know which comes first in these processes. And I'll address that some more. So some basic fundamental physiology is important to be aware of when we're thinking about tree death, I think, which is that water moves along a tension gradient from the soil through the xylem, out the stomata, to the atmosphere. This is transpiration, right? And when the stomata, or in this case a singular stoma, is open, photosynthesis is allowed. CO2 can diffuse in. And the carbohydrates are then used for respiration, carbohydrate storage, like for the bad times, uh, defense, and biomass. Now, there's other things it's used for, but I'm highlighting the key things that are big pools, big fluxes, and also relevant to tree survival. So if we turn off the tap, and there's no more precipitation, and the soil water is very low, what plants typically do is close their stomata to avoid desiccation avoid drying out. And if they don't do that, or don't do it adequately, then the hypothesis is that they will die of hydraulic failure, which is irreversible desiccation of their tissues. Right? And there's evidence that that occurs, especially in species like eucalypts. Now, photosynthesis, though, is curtailed if they close their stomata to avoid desiccation. Right? And that means the plant then has to survive on its stored carbohydrates. But because respiration has to continue, it, may, it does decline some, but it still has to continue to stay alive to maintain metabolism. That means that if there's nothing coming in, the pool of supply has to go down. This is just thermodynamics. And it could impact defense, and it definitely impacts biomass. So this is basically a cartoon version of the hypotheses. And this is the, another cartoon that I see used a lot that I thinks a little bit too simplistic, but this is another way of looking at it, which is that if you have a very long drought event, the plants may shut their stomata, and they have to rely on their carbohydrates, but at some point they're going to cross a threshold where they're out of carbohydrates, right? If you have an intense event of water stress, they may not run out of carbohydrates before they simply dehydrate. This is simplistic, and there's this box I like to highlight is these things can interact. One thing I really don't like about this figure is I think the biotic agents should also be around the outside here because they often are the last step to death, right? So this is a, a simple idea, and I think that's why it's attractive, but also why it gets a lot of attention, both positive and negative, in the literature. Is some people like to say, well, it's just too simplistic. You know, plants are complicated. and So, I, so I'll highlight both why, they're, why I agree with those naysayers and, and why I don't. Um, first of all, we just know this relationship. Everyone in the physiological world knows that photosynthesis goes down if stomatal conductance goes down, right? So if a drought pushes a plant to be here, it's not going to take up carbon. So uh, this is probably the most hardcore physiology f set of slides, if you want to tune out for a minute. But this is, I think it's the funnest stuff. So here's stomatal conductance, how open the stomata are as a function of leaf water potential. More negative means more water stress, okay? So the plants shut their stomata, 
as they have more water stress. Here you can see two different species. Uh, in, these are the ones that are in my backyard, juniper and pinion. And the pinion is what we have labeled relatively isohydric, meaning it shuts its stomata fast. And the juniper is relatively anisohydric. I like to highlight that there's no such thing truly as isohydric besides algae, which lives in water, right? I mean, everything is somewhat anisohydric. It's just a matter of degree. So this, this dichotomy has resulted in some, some fun discussions with stomata experts. The, um, another figure we're showing here then is the same x-axis, the water potential. In this case, we're calling it xylem pressure, but it's the same thing, versus the loss of conductivity through, through the stem, through the xylem. Right? And you can see that these two species have very different vulnerabilities. The juniper is much less vulnerable than the pinion. Okay, and this makes sense. This is no surprise. Some plants are more drought tolerant than others, and more drought hard, you know, hardy, we'd call them. Here's the consequence on carbon of those hydraulic strategies, is that the juniper can maintain its stomata relatively open as water potential declines. Therefore, it has much more photosynthesis, right? Whereas the pinion has a very steeply declining pattern of photosynthesis with water potential. This isn't a whole lot of data points, but We've measured it a ton more since then, and this, this is a pretty solid lines here. So then you can use this, this relationship, and because we can measure these parameters, we can back calculate, well, what was photosynthesis and what was the loss of conductivity? And that's what this shows. I already showed you these two figures now, conductivity loss and the photosynthesis loss as a function of the same x-axis, xylem tension. Here's a long-term record of water potential again, which is the same as these axes, okay, for a field site behind my office. And this, uh, you can see that the juniper indeed was more anisohydric. It bounces around much more than the pinion. But because of the shape of these curves, the juniper has almost no loss of conductivity. Now here you can see we're in a severe drought in the 2002-2003, right? And at that point, because of the pinion's much more vulnerable curves, it should have all the way up to 100% loss of conductivity, which we would define as hydraulic failure. So if you didn't look at the bottom figure, we'd say, oh, they died of hydraulic failure. But if you look at the bottom figure, it changes the story a little bit. Because of this relationship and this steep decline, the photosynthetic rates for pinion were also bottoming out before they died. right? So which is it? Is it hydraulic failure or carbon starvation? Well, this false dichotomy obviously doesn't work, right? We can't, have, we can't say it's one or the other, at least in this case. And it seems like in most of the evidence we're seeing now, it's, it's consistent. It's not that often that it's one or the other, except in a few cases. So an alternative hypothesis that was put out in the literature was that, well, trees are not carbon limited. And this comes from limited data from stressed but not killed plants that show they have elevated carbohydrates. This has been great for our science. We've had tons of debates you know, publicly and on the phone, et cetera, about this. And it's, it's been really productive. Uh, my point would be that you have to study something, you have to study it, right? So if you're studying plant death, you have to kill the plants. And these arguments were from plants that hadn't been killed. So we know that. We know that photosynthesis, this is the start of a drought, and the drought's continuing. We know that photosynthesis crashes, but that growth crashes faster. Okay? This results in a surplus of carbohydrates. But eventually, respiration continues, and so the carbohydrates decline. And so, and most of the data that I'm seeing in the last year or two is supporting this now. And we had a nice meeting at the Ecological Society of America a couple of weeks ago where some of the multiple of the naysayers came up to me and, and they've really changed their tune and they're buying this. You know, we're all in agreement now, so we're all a big happy family again. But, um, but again, it's been productive. The other main point I want to make with this complicated slide is I wanted to highlight that we can't have a false dichotomy that carbon and water and other factors are all interacting, right? So for example, you have more embolism, which is hydraulic failure, as the drought continues. Well, this can feed back and reduce photosynthetic rates right here, OK? Because you can't move water to the stomata. The stomata have to shut. That's just an example, right? If you have a reduction in carbohydrate availability, 
that it's very difficult to refill cavitated elements, which is complicated physiology we don't have to go into, except for I'll just say that it's an energy requiring process to refill xylem that's lost its water. Right? Also, the two things that are really poorly studied in the literature now, they're, they're well studied, but they aren't linked up, are defense and biotic agents. For example, mountain pine beetles killing lodgepole pine trees from Colorado to northern British Columbia right now. Massive, massive epidemic. It's been going on for years, six, seven years now. And what's happening with that particular species is that it usually lives down here in, at small levels. But once we start having enough hosts, enough trees that are suffering, that are vulnerable, the population grows. And in the case of mountain pine beetle, and also some dendroctinous species in, in Eurasia, they can get to a point where their population size is so huge that they can kill very healthy, happy trees because the attack rate is so enormous, right? So then it leaves beyond, it goes beyond drought at this point. It can start raining and be nice climate, but the tree death continues for years. And that's what we're seeing up the spine of the Rockies right now. This is a major, uh, I would just mention for the modelers in the room, I think this is the place where we can make the biggest dent on improving our models. Unfortunately for me, it's, I'm not an entomologist, but I think this is where we really, because this is the big vegetation killer in the northern hemisphere, right? All these processes lead into this and they feed back. It's not that the physiology is irrelevant, but this is, very, no one's really trying to model this right now that I'm aware of. So just one more comment on the debates that are out there. People like to say, well, plants are really, you know, they're really complicated and you can't have a one answer fits all solution. Well, that's true to some extent. I would argue that, however, that there are certain processes, for example, these for example, that are common across all vascular plants, right? And we have to know these common mechanisms for tree death or plant death in order for the models to be able to do simulations. However, plants aren't all the same. We have annuals that grow for three weeks, reproduce, and die. I mean, they don't have the same necessary strategies as, let's say, a thousand-year-old redwood tree, right? So it's understanding those differences among the plant functional types that we have to also get for the, for the models. Right. So we have a lot of research to do. But I still contend that the framework we propose is very useful for, for trying to find out what are the differences and what are the similarities. So now I'll do, show you some empirical results as well as some modeling results from a, a DOE-funded experiment that's in its seventh year where we put in three replicated drought plots, which you can see here, to remove about half of the precipitation as well as three controls where these are turned upside down so they still get the water, um, and then some ambient controls and some irrigation plots. I'm just going to show you the results from these guys primarily right now. So first of all, lots of trees died. And actually now, now this line is down here. Um, the final pinion trees are now dying this summer. But most of them died in the first year. The majority did. And what you can see in regards to the hydraulic failure hypothesis is shown here is the transpiration rates for pinion, red is drought, black is ambient control. That's what the ones with the, without any troughs on them. Uh, you can see transpiration was much lower after the drought treatment started for both species, pinion and juniper. And this analysis, which we did with John Sperry, suggests that the hydraulic failure was an important process. The key word here is process. I don't know if it was the end point. What you can see then is this is the number of days within each PLC class. PLC stands for percent loss of conductivity, cavitation, right? How dried out did the wood get? So the, and that's on the x-axis. So really dry, not dry at all. Really cavitated, not cavitated at all. And you can see that in the trees that die, which are the black bars, they spent more time with low conductivity than trees that survived in both species. And here are the mean values for dead and surviving by species. So John would like to say, well, it's all about the hydraulics, right? But actually, there wasn't much at 100% failure, which make, begs the question, how, how, how much hydraulic failure do we need for it to actually have a consequence on the leaves, right? So here's, um, this is, I'm sorry, I apologize for this figure. This is a, a work in progress, but this is 
I'm kind of excited about it, so I decided to show it. We compared four different models, um, estimates of percent loss of conductivity for pinion control and pinion drought. So you can see higher values means more loss of conductivity, more cavitation, right? And the models generally are showing that there's more cavitation in pinion pines that are droughted than those that were in the controls. Same for the juniper. If you remember how juniper doesn't cavitate much compared to pinion, you can see that borne out in the model simulations here as well. Now, if you take the ensemble of all of these simulations and plot it up as the dying trees minus the surviving trees, now we're just looking at ones that died on the droughts plots versus ones that survived on the ambient plots. And on the ambient plot, survived means ambient. It's the same thing. Nothing died there. A few survived on the drought plots at the time of this analysis. Anyway, the point is an increase in this value means that dying plants had um, more PLC, more cavitation, more hydraulic failure than those that lived. And this is what the models suggest, is that pinion has quite a bit and juniper has a bit, but not a lot. Okay, so there's some consistency across these models. I note that, you know, Sperry model is an individual plant level model, whereas ED is intended to be a global dynamic vegetation model. So we're crossing quite a bit of scale here. But the big question is, well, how, how you know, is this enough loss of hydraulic conductivity to actually kill plants? We don't know that. We don't know that hydraulic failure killed plants. We just know it was an important part of the process. There's quite a bit of other evidence that suggests that the process of hydraulic failure is, is important. Okay, so what about carbohydrates? This has been a hot topic lately. Uh, this is evidence from the same, same uh, experiment, pinion pine. Trees that died in 2008 have the lowest values you can see right here. You also see a lot of seasonality. Trees that died in 2009 are shown here. They have lower values, and the ones that survive have the highest values. Okay, so another way to plot that up is just the difference between the survivors and the dyers, right? So here's the difference. In this case, you can see that trees that died, and I've added some juniper trees now to this figure, usually have lower carbohydrate concentrations than the ones that survive. Does this mean they died of carbon starvation? I, don't, I wouldn't suggest that. It just means the process is, is a relevant process that's occurring. This one, this one I'm interested in. I'm not sure how to interpret it yet for sure, but the length of survival after the drought initiation, so these are all points for trees that died now, is related to the average non-structural carbohydrate concentration, right? And these are junipers out here. And we'll be able to add some more, more, a lot more trees now, um, but at the time when I made this figure, this is all we had. But it does suggest a, a relationship. And there's a lot of other papers that show that carbohydrates decline before death. Back to the multi-model comparison for the same experiment. You see that the models also show a decline in carbohydrates in trees that die compared to those that survive. Okay? So there's some agreement across these variety of models. In this case, we also have the new version of CLM from Rosie Fisher in, in this uh, simulation. So there's lots of questions. We're making progress. I don't think we have the answers yet. Now, one thing I was pushing in the last uh, paper I wrote was that we need to think of this not as a dichotomy, one hypothesis versus the other, but as interdependent processes. Um, and the models also suggest that they're interdependent. If you have, this is, again, an ensemble of all the different models showing that you have more loss of conductivity in trees that die compared to those that live. And at the same time, so going along this axis means more loss of conductivity. And going along this axis means lower NSC, lower carbohydrates. And you can see that they suggest that both conductivity and carbohydrates go down these pinions before they die. Again, the encouraging thing is the models are somewhat consistent. The discouraging thing is we still don't know how they died, right? One more encouraging result is just on percent mortality. These are the two models that actually simulate, have a, a point in their equation to say, okay, the tree is dead now, right? And um, ED and CLMED both were able to capture somewhat well the observed mortality of pinion pine. But don't be fooled that that's so exciting. There's some bad news, too, from a modeling perspective is that, and this is a bit complicated, but this is just an example from one model called the TREES model, which stands for Terrestrial Ecosystem Simulator or something like that from Scott Mackay. 
It's a really nice model, ecosystem scale model. And what he showed was that, wow, look at this. The carbohydrates are lowest in the dying pinion. And they did die here. Wow, so it was carbon starvation. Oh, wait a minute, no. Maybe it was loss of conductivity, because he shows they had the highest loss of conductivity. Well, what gets worse then is he simulates, and we've observed, even lower carbohydrate concentrations in trees that didn't die in 2008. They were even lower in 2011, day 1600, because we had a really severe drought last summer. Really severe. Yet these trees did not die. Okay, same here with hydraulic connectivity. So and we can make it worse. Here's the ED model, which actually accurately killed trees in 2008, but it inaccurately killed trees in 2011. They didn't die in 2011. Now they are in 2012, but that's just because I got an email a couple weeks ago saying they're dying. You know, we don't haven't really looked at the, the, the information yet on it fully. The point here is that beetles were around in 2008 and beetles were not around in 2011. We don't know why they weren't around, but we do know that in January of 2011, there was a record cold event, um, like minus 30 or 40 or something like that. And that's down where, the, in the literature, they say that bark beetles die. So it could have been this cold event saved these guys for a year. Um, again, this is why I think really this field needs to move towards doing, working with entomologists um, and not just focusing so much on tree physiology. So path forward. One of our next steps, this is just, I want kind of half, this is slide is half for an advertisement. I'm always looking for collaborators. We have a new DOE funded project where again we have a drought structure, but we've also added open top chambers where we're elevating the temperature by five Celsius above ambient because we know that heat is a big part of drought. And all the data I've shown you so far was just a reduction in precipitation. We didn't change the temperature. Um, and so basically, basically, we're trying to address these two axes on this figure by changing the temperature and changing the precipitation. We expect that water, a decline in water should kill trees a little bit. An increase in temperature should kill trees a little bit. But if you do them both, it should be even faster and more, right? It's kind of a logical hypothesis. But it hasn't been tested. Uh, another path forward that your colleague Jeff Chambers here is helping us a lot with is looking at developing global mortality benchmarks. We can't test the models beyond a plot scale unless we have the data. And so far, there's no remote sensing product that gives us a global or even regional estimate of tree death, right? We know how productivity might change, but we can't say what caused that change in productivity. So this is just an example from the Amazon that we're working on with Jeff. We also need to be able to attribute that mortality in order to test the models at large scales, right? If, 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 we, can't, if we can tell the model that something died but not why, it's not as informative if, if, as if we can say, well, this one died from fire, this died from wind throw, this died from some sort of drought insect attack. So this is an example. Los Alamos is right there. My house is right there. Uh, the lab is right in here, and uh, Santa Fe is off down this way. And we were, we've now got a, a method, to, at least in this system, to separate fire from drought and beetles. Those are the only two big killers in this system. And it starts from going at the you know, really high, high detail level measurements with fine scale resolution, resolution all the way up to MODIS. So... I was uh, going to decide if I should show these last five slides based on time, and then I think I have time, so I'm going to do it. You guys still have a, enough attention? Bill, you look wrapped with this. Yeah, okay. So, um, so um, Dan Binkley gave me these pictures once. I like them. This next five slides is sort of uh, one paper that I want to tell you about because it just was accepted Friday, and it, it played a huge role in our testimony to the Senate on Friday. Because it was accepted, we were finally allowed to talk about it. So we had to change our testimonies at, at the last possible minute. So what this paper, this was done by Park Williams, a postdoc of mine. And what he did is he took all the tree ring records for ponderosa pine, Douglas fir, and pinyon pine for the southwest. Something like 390 different sites that were tree ring cores. Often they were cores, sometimes they were slabs like this had been collected and dated rigorously. And they're part of a tree ring database. 
And what you can see, and what he wanted to do was to understand, well, what's been going on with drought and tree responses in the past, and how might that relate to what's going to happen in the future? So this figure here shows the ring width index, how big, how fat are the rings, right, for pinyon pine, ponderosa pine, and dug fir. And you can see that there's a lot of correlation between the species. This is good news because it means we have a regionally coherent signal, okay? So from now on, we won't talk about the specific species, but just all of them as a whole. One of the punchlines is that, that I'm going to come back to is that as temperature goes up, the evaporative moisture demand, VPD, vapor pressure deficit, whatever you want to call it, increases, and it's nonlinear, right? And this is data for that region, which shows you which months are the hottest and driest. As we know, climate change, global warming, is causing this to move up which means this is going to go up, right? This causes the stomata on plants to shut if it goes up high enough, right? So this figure will be very important in the next few slides. So he calls it FDSI, the Forest Drought Severity Index, which is, the, which is basically a statistical product of the correlation, autocorrelation along the, the series, right? And what you can see is that when there's more drought stress, basically the ring widths are smaller, right? And during wet, happy periods, this is when everybody in New Mexico tells me they were skiing a ton. Unfortunately, I didn't live there at that time. Um, wet periods have higher values. And you can see what we've been going into in the last few years. And this is the correlation between, I believe red is the tree rings and black is a model based on two parameters statistical model. Those two parameters are vapor pressure deficit and precipitation. This is vapor pressure deficit in the summer and precipitation in the winter. So these are meaningful va variables because we measure them around the world and because we know as physiologists that they drive tree function. And you can see VPD was actually a slightly higher contributor than precipitation was, 55 versus 45 or so. So this index in the last 20 years or so is strongly correlated with a number of parameters that are important impacts on the Earth's surface, at least in the southwest. FDSI is strongly correlated with NDVI. It's a remotely sensed index of how green the surface is, right? Really strong correlation. It's strongly correlated with the percent dead biomass on the landscape. And this is from the FIA Forest Inventory and Analysis data sets. And you can see that in the 2000s, we had a huge amount of mortality, more than a doubling for these three species. These are big numbers. You can see that the bark beetle attacked area, as assessed from aerial surveys that the Forest Service does, so it's the surface of the landscape that's been hit by bark beetles, is also well correlated with the ring width index. And last but not least, the most high profile thing these days in the southwest is wildfires. I mean, it seems like every year now we have a new record-sized wildfire. Um, wildfires correlated really well with the drought index as well. Notice that these two axes are logarithmic, so these are big numbers. So because our tree ring record went back 1,000 years, we could actually model VPD and precipitation back 1,000 years, or, or the, the combined effect of those two on tree rings. And you can see it nicely highlights what was already recognized as the mega droughts of the 1200s and the 1500s in the southwest. So this is just somewhat confirmatory that our way of looking at this is consistent with, with the other tree ring analyses that have been done. So you can see these two events were really, were really big ones. Notice that we're entering another one that's getting down in that scale. And actually, Park told me that as of this summer, we're we're down, at, we're down below the 50s drought now consistently, and we're really close to the 1500s. So if you look at the IPCC predictions, AR5, for VPD and precipitation and temperature, you can make some forecasts based on the past data, with all the caveats that that was past data being used to make predictions about the future. But the reviewers made us do a ton of sensitivity analysis and we came away feeling like this is somewhat robust. We know that VPD is going to go up, right? And that is because temperature is going up. 
precipitation currently for the southwest is not predicted to have any dramatic changes, which does mean, though, that there will continue to be severe droughts, severe low periods of low precipitation, potentially. But the mean is not necessarily going to change. But on top of these little dips, these little droughts, we have way higher temperature and much higher VPD. So if you just use that simple statistical model we developed to make a prediction of FDSI, we are at the mega drought level by 2045. In other words, it won't be a drought then. It'll be the normal condition. But the normal condition will be equivalent to a condition that caused the mass migration of the ancestral Puebloans from the southwest. It caused massive tree mortality because it's very hard to find any live trees that date before the 1200s. So this, in other words, bad news. Um, so you can predict the percent of years that are equivalent to the mega drought conditions of the 1200s and 1500s, and that uh, we're already right here. This is a new figure that includes 2012 estimates through July. Um, and we're probably going to be up, you know, consistently in a dry, in a dry world. So in conclusion, this is my other happy picture. Um, you, may, you know, I think you've got my conclusions. I think what we're doing as a society studying this is really important. I think it's not going to go away. I think we have a lot more to do. We are making progress, but I, I think we have a lot to do, especially in the integration of the modeling and the measurements and the theory measurements both on the ground scale or via satellite. Is that we have to apply all of our tools to understand this problem, let alone to solve the problem. And that was the other thing that Senator Bingham was asking me on Friday, was, well, what do we do? You know, and it's like nobody could give him, you know, none of us were quite allowed to say the obvious thing. But, you know, so and that left us with not being able to say anything, really. I mean, you, you Without curbing fossil fuel emissions, there's just no change. And, and he was smart. He already understood that if we curbed all fossil fuel emissions today, we would still have this problem for 100 years or more, right? So, so mitigation is a big deal. So thank you for your time. It's been nice. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Nate. So just to let people know about timing, we have this room for another half hour, and then Nate's going to lunch at the cafeteria, and people are welcome to join him. But it means we have plenty of time for discussion. So I'll just deliver this. Okay. The microphone will be delivered. <laughs> All at once. All this is. Yeah, I got the right answer. You got the right answer for the wrong reason, I believe. Well, it, it, and they don't have that. Yeah, I mean, this is the, right? This is what you're talking about. If we stopped the slide here and didn't look at this, we'd say this is really good, you know, like I showed you here. <coughs> this looks like a great performance. And this looks like less of a, I mean, it just tells us we got it right for the wrong reason. Right? That's all. What do you mean? Yeah, I see your point. And I don't I think we would have to just do the test to find out, it seems like. Work together to find that out. The, my concern with this is that we could actually if beetles if we have more cold events, let's say, in the future which isn't what the data suggests. But let's say that there's more extreme cold events and the beetles get wiped out. Or the beetles get some pathogen that hasn't been introduced yet and they get wiped out. Or we come up with some way to knock them out. Um, then we're going to kill trees incorrectly in our future simulations. It won't, we'll, we'll say it's worse than it is, right? That's what this shows, I think. Todd had a question. Right. Uh, yep. 
Yeah, we didn't do it with that data set, but we do have a data set that Nathan English is should be publishing, should be sometime soon, uh, where we looked at like 12 sites around the West Coast. We used the same sites that I showed really early on with the big red dots and looked at C13 and O18 and growth rates. And it turned out that in all sites but one, um, the growth rates were always lower in trees that died. Okay, no big surprise, right? What was cool about those, it was like decades long, two, three decades of low growth, um, which casts into doubt, just incidentally, the experiments that I've been doing, because they're very unreal. We just hit the plant really hard with a drought, you know? But anyway, the C13 and O18 often would be very different between live and dead, but not in a consistent way. Like, so we might hypothesize C13 would be more enriched in trees that die because of water stress, right? And we totally see that in some systems, and then we kept measuring more and more, and we found that it was, plenty of times it was more negative. Same with the O18. So we're, I'm kind of at a loss how to interpret it. I have the data, though, and I'll, I'll bust it out later. <laughs> Maybe you can help me figure it out. So in terms of the whoa, uh, carbon cycle consequences of these big die-offs, um, what do we know about the ecosystem dynamics in terms of, you know, for example, as all these um, the pinions die off, do the junipers then experience less competition? Are they able to sort of take over? Are there other species that, successional dynamics that come in? It seems early successional um, communities can often have very high NPP, so mm -hmm. does this really mean tons of carbon flying off into the atmosphere? Like, what actually happens? That's a great question, and I think people are working on it. The I think it depends on the system a lot in regards to what's going to come in and how fast. So in the Amazon, I think part of our problem in really detecting death with remote sensing is it's so green the next day, right? Um, but you still lost. If you lose an old growth tree in the Amazon, it's still losing tons of carbon. And the stuff that's coming in underneath it, it's going to take a while to build up that storage again. So people have done the analyses to show that even if you replace an old growth forest with a young, much more rapidly growing forest, the loss of that carbon can take decades to replace. Right? So it, it almost certainly, when amassed over the globe, it is a, a source. It is causing a source. But the big question is how long does it last um, before it gets back to being neutral or get back, gets back to even storing as much as it had? And that's going to vary regionally and with biomes. In my particular system that I study a lot, we have zero pinion seedlings that have made it through these, these events that we can find. So it's, it is a complete structural change. And now we're witnessing junipers dying, and they're not being replaced. And so we've taken it from a woody ecosystem to a grassland. And there's no evidence that reproduction will happen. In Colorado, one that I'm interested in right now, there's been this massive outbreak and all these lodgepole pine trees are dying all over the landscape. And people are saying, well, it's okay because there's all these seedlings, you know, stuff this tall of spruce and the shade-tolerant plants that typically would come in late successional under lodgepole. But they're more drought-sensitive species. So the likelihood of them making it to old growth, is, given the projections of future climate, are pretty low. So I think it's an important point, and it's not all, it's not like we're going to a moonscape necessarily. But, yeah. So I had a question about the last couple of slides, the tree ring analysis. Um, did I understand correctly that you showed a nice correlation between summertime VPT, VBD, VPD, and uh, was it wintertime precipitation? Well, the, the two parameters that explain the ring widths are winter precipitation yeah, okay. and summer VPD. Right. So have you looked at the uh, influence of how that winter precipitation falls? Is it important if it comes as snow? Yeah, right. yeah. Or is it important if it comes, because that has to do with timing of melting, et cetera. Right. Have, have you guys looked at that any? Not in this paper, but in the modeling analysis I showed for Western North America, we looked at it. And, and as you'd expect, stuff melts faster, more of it falls as rain than snow. Yeah. And that results in more water stress because there's more loss to the to runoff 
and less to infiltration into the soil. But that's yeah. just a modeling analysis, right? Because my thoughts are those would have really nice implications for California because there's a big issue of wintertime precipitation. Is it going to come as snow? And if it's not, and I, maybe I'm wrong, but are there as many tree ring studies done in California as there on the southwest? Probably not, right? I or, don't know quantitatively. Yeah, I don't know either. But I mean, California's been studied pretty well in almost everything, right? So I would imagine it's not bad. Yeah, I was just thinking that would be just a real interesting yeah, yeah. topic to look at. Uh -huh. So I was wondering if you've looked at the role of oxidative stress. A lot of these processes induce the accumulation of reactive oxygen yeah. species. And so if, if that might be another cause of, of, of death. Absolutely. We have not. But I'm, I'm very aware of what you're talking about. And I think it's really important. The... Um, what we found, what we have done in our, in our little case study, the one where I have the heating as well as the droughting of pinions mm -hmm. and junipers, is we're measuring canopy temperatures. And quite contrary to the dogma that conifer needles are at air temperature, ours are routinely 5 Celsius above air temperature. Um, which, so then when it gets to 40 Celsius atmospheric temperature, which it does in the peak drought, like in, in June and July, it did this year, that means those leaves are at 45 plus because they're not moving water. They're not convectively cooling. And this should create great, and a great environment in the leaf to create a lot of reactive oxygen, right? And my hypothesis would be then that if you're starving for carbon, so really short on metabolites and, and energy to, re, to, to quench oxygen or to repair damage to ox, um, damaged tissues from the free radicals, that, that could be a step towards the a tipping point for killing the tree. Mm -hmm. But I haven't tested that, and I don't think anybody has. Yeah, so there are several assays that are pretty easy for, like, lipid peroxidation uh, to, look, to look at that. All right, so I could maybe catch up with you later. Okay. If they're easy. <laughs> they're they're uh, routine, I guess. Routine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, we have for multiple species, including pinion. What we find is, so I mentioned earlier that the growth rates tend to be lower, so there's less wood production. The, the really good predictor that seems to be popping out from a bunch of different um, work that my students have been doing is that the resin ducts, which is a duct, if not everybody knows, but they're formed in the wood and they're a storage location for sap, for resin, which is used to to occlude bark beetles when they're trying to enter. It's really carbon rich. It's full of toxins for the insects. So the amount of resin ducts that are produced is a really strong predictor of death, it turns out. More resin ducts, less death. And that's been the one that's really popping out quite consistently across our analyses. Is it very source? Yes. Well, I know that resin's 85% carbon. It's the most highest carbon content tissue or whatever you want to call it, you know, compound in a plant that I'm aware of. And so that's a big cost. What I haven't done is scale it up at the whole plant level to say, well, how much of GPP or MPP is going into resin? But it must be pretty high. Uh-huh. Yeah. So pinions obviously have those wonderful nuts that all of those all those people in the southwest go and, and harvest around fall time. Has all of that also been dropping oh, yeah. precipitously? I haven't seen a, a reproductive event since I moved there. And I've been looking because of this. I haven't seen one. At least in my local, like my office is in a pinion juniper woodland. So speaking for that hectare, um, and I know the price has gone way up. Mm -hmm. But they're getting them from somewhere because you can still make pesto, right? So. Is that China. where they're coming from? Ah, thank and, God for China. And then one, one other, just from a word perspective, I find the, the concept of needle leaf evergreen trees a little bit oxymoronic. Needle leaf? Well, there's broadleaf evergreen. But if you're needles, are they really leaves? Oh, that's a tax. Yeah, if you, that was a modeling term. We could use a different <laughs> term. What would you like me to suggest to Sarah to use? 
I, I just find needle leaf stuck together is kind of odd. And okay. Uh, well, maybe maybe my CLM modelers here can relay that information at the next um, Breckenridge meeting. <laughs> No, it's your fault. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm wondering how applicable the conclusions that you're drawing with regards to trees in the West are to grasses in the Midwest. Right. And can we expect similar dynamics when we look to the more of the central United States? Yeah, I would love, I think we should be doing this with grasses because they're going to rule the world, right? And it's so important. Well, and in theory. But yeah, yeah, and good point. And, it's, and for the agricultural reasons, there's so many reasons we should be doing this on grasses, and we're not. I've talked, I've spoke with Colin Osborne and Troy Oakletree, who are both grass physiology specialists, and we want to do this stuff together. And all of the discussions and the little things we write on the back of napkins suggest. I mean, they're still vascular plants. They still have to move water. They still have to survive on carbohydrates, but they have rootstocks oftentimes. They have much more clonal, not all, but some are clonal. I mean, there's ways to survive. They're used to being mowed down by fires in some systems. So one might expect that they're more resilient to these processes, but ultimately they're going to die. An example is if things get bad enough. So an example is like we pulled up a bunch of weeds in my yard on the, out, on the edge of my fence recently. And they keep coming up, my wife's saying, well, you know, you didn't do a good job, you know, <laughs> telling me how I need to work hard. So I just, but there's not many, there's just a few leaves that pop up. And I just go every couple days and I pull them off. And I am assuring her, these things are going to die if I keep doing that. Because they, they have to run out of photosynthesis at some point. <laughs> so I can only speculate. It seems like they'll probably be more resilient than trees. But they can't, they can't survive on nothing, right? So... So I had two questions. The first one was just brainstorming what you think are the low-hanging fruit in terms of adding <coughs> causes of mortality or rates of mortality to CLM or other global or add global models. So you had a long table about, of processes. You ended up with the beetle, which I think is maybe a hard one. Not, you're not just ready to add it overnight. Right. So what are, do you see any? Well, the, near I think the highest, I mean, if we could get beetles correct, that would probably be the most beneficial thing to do. And people have, we've been looking into it. Chang Gang Zhu, used to mo a modeler guy on my team, used to model mosquitoes for human health reasons, right? So there is potential. I mean, there is a framework to, to begin working on that if, uh, if we can. And then, but in terms of low-hanging fruit, I think one low-hanging fruit, actually, for me, is to develop some benchmarks and just test the models as they are. Because it hasn't been done. Right? And we will probably learn so much from that. I mean, one question I didn't highlight here is we don't know that the models are actually bad. We don't know that maybe those algorithms are, are sufficient. Right? We, we haven't even asked that question yet. We've added hydraulic failure, carbon starvation, their interdependency to ED already. And it, you know, it did seem to work well. But I don't know that it's, that's one field site. Okay, and then I have one that's far more speculative. We've been talking a lot about the terrestrial carbon sink and the future of the carbon sink and how, for example, nitrogen limitation might limit CO2 fertilization. But just taking this angle of the mortality angle, you know, just for fun, what do you think that's saying about the future of the terrestrial carbon sink? Oh, you know, I what, think it's think? diminishing returns, most likely, because the... People say migration, I'm not an expert on migration, but migration should be much slower than climate change, right? So we're going to not migration. plant migration, sorry. And um, so it's going to be hard to keep up with the changes that are happening across the world. On CO2 fertilization, we just wrote a paper with Peter Franks uh, as the lead, looking at, well, what are the real benefits of CO2 fertilization at different scales? And you, there's, this, there's this paper by... Gedeloff and Berg, I think it is, in 2010, where they looked at all the tree ring data sets for the whole world to look for, is there a CO2 fertilization signal? And in 20% of like 1,200 sites, 20% of them showed a fertilization response. That's not many, right? And the others were largely limited by, they, they said, nutrients, uh, drought, and maybe temperature. 
So I don't think CO2 fertilization is really going to help us too much. Yeah, abso absolutely. So I, yeah, there's two answers that come to mind. One is that, back to the beetles, they are, according to the entomologists I've worked with, they are the number one killer worldwide. Because there's all of Eurasia, right? That's, there's a dendroctinous, a variety of dendro dendroctinous species that are killing spruce and pines. And so beetles is, in terms of surface area of the earth, I still think that's a good target to go after. But I agree with your point, and I like it, because I am much more attracted to a universal theory, a universal framework that would matter. And I, and, and I think this whole hydraulic framework is somewhat universal in the sense of you look at shade tolerance and all these seedlings that die in the shade in the eastern forests, right, or in the tropics. I mean, that's a carbon problem. Now, that may not die of carbon starvation. They may die of some pathogen, right? So I think there is promise for these fr this framework to be used really broadly. Same with in the... Boreal North or, or anywhere else. What's hard is that there's so many pathogens, right? And that's why rather than try to understand all of them, I'm more attracted to trying to understand what would push a plant to just be vulnerable to them, you know? But then you add invasives, which completely screws up that idea, right? Because they may just have a way of killing a perfectly healthy plant. Kudzu, there's all kinds of examples, so. But yeah, I think it's promising. Uh -huh. So I was thinking, it is like, you know, is it um, do you die of AIDS or do you die of pneumonia? Right. right. Is it the proximal or is it the proximal? Right. If it's the case that there's so many pathogens that once you become vulnerable, something's going to kill you one way or another. Maybe you get lucky for a year and it takes a beetle attack, but next year they get you. If it's like the beetle, it's a fungus. So then, in that case, it makes the power lot easier for modeling purposes right. and for having a universal sort of. That's a great point. That's a great point. But if it's the case of the interaction between the proximal causes and the distal causes that actually matter, then that's much more complicated. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, in California, I've heard of some folks identifying uh, genetically individuals of a species that have been resistant to drought or uh, bark beetle, um, and then propagating them and having this sort of stock of these greenhouse plants. Have you had any thoughts to doing that in the, in the southwest? Well, they've observed it with pinion, too. I'll just mention. It was a cool story. The, uh, the, from a group in Northern Arizona University, they found that for years, they were studying these pinions, and they found there was really strong genetic differences in, in between these two populations, living side by side. Some of them were vulnerable to this moth that would defoliate them. It didn't kill them, but it really made them stunted and ugly. <coughs> and then there's other ones that were resistant to those moths. And then when the big drought came in 2002, the ones that were resistant died. And the ones that were vulnerable to the moths lived. And this makes great sense hydraulically and physiologically because they had less water stress, they had less leaf area. They've been pruned functionally, right? So I think that kind of thing is really common. There's, there's genetic variability in the physiology and in the vulnerability, and, and promoting that would be a great idea. The challenge there is getting the forestry organizations, the U.S. Forest Service, to... Well, it, gets, it goes above them. They need the funding to actually go and do this stuff. Right, and instead they're putting most of their funding into fighting fires. Um, 
which isn't working, right? So they, it, it, I think that is a, a, an important thing to do. Also, moving them north, you know, is another important step we need to do if we want to keep growing trees. But I haven't, you know, that's beyond my, I don't want to fight an uphill battle. In California right now, they're, they're also uh, turning that problem around and basically turn, getting industry in, interested in it. So uh -huh. several of the timber companies, Green Diamond Timber here in California in particular, they're asking for help in getting seed collection throughout the range of a lot of the economies here in California. But they can grow them up uh -huh. and basically have the genetic stock available for doing adaptive management and planting. They still want to grow wood. Right. right. Well, that's a cool concept. So taking it one step further, it sounds like what you're saying is 50 years from now, like the surviving forests, the productive, healthy forests are going to be on the private timberlands, you know, and the, what, a, what a switch, you know. Right. That's a, good, that's a great idea. So, so private timberlands as genetic biodiversity resources. <laughs> that's great. Thanks for all the great questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.